Um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, um, depending on your time zone, you're very, very welcome to this, um, I believe it's the second um, um, seminar organised by the um, Department of English and Communication at PolyU. And I'm absolutely and utterly delighted to introduce um, Dr. Richard Sampson, um, who is a fantastic colleague I have worked with um, previously, and uh, he's a leading expert in the area of um, language learning motivation and feelings, feelings in language education, and particularly he does so through the lens of complexity theory and combines this with practitioner research, and that's what we're really interested to hear about, you know, this new paradigm that's establishing itself and Richard has done a lot, lot of work in this area, particularly through action research. So um, we're very excited to have you here, Richard. Thank you for accepting our invitation and over to you. Al, well, thank you very much for that, that kind introduction and thank you everyone for coming to listen to this talk today. Uh, I hope you can see my slides all right. So I've kind of got me half on screen and my slides as well. So just firstly, a quick overview of what we'll look at in this session. I'm going to commence with an introduction to complexity thinking upon which I'll base my arguments for the need for more classroom research. And we're then going to look at some different forms of classroom research. Uh, after that, I'll go over some examples of my own research, and then I'll wrap up. So perhaps surprisingly for some, I'd like to commence a look at complexity not with abstract equations or computer models. Uh, let's start by considering ourselves as fine examples of complex beings. So, of course, we have pasts, such as my own endeavours to build a pool with my twin brother here from a long time ago. Uh, we may have come from different countries or be living in different countries now. Many of us will also have had our own experiences of additional language learning. So a whole confluence of elements are woven together to find ourselves where we are now and who we are now. Yet, as Miyahara has pointed out, researchers in particular are not versed in sharing about ourselves. It's as if research appears from a void somewhere rather than emerging from the experiences of living human beings. So let's start with a question then. Uh, what additional languages have you studied? And if you remember, how were your emotions connected to those languages? If you can, please just type something quickly into the chat. Just what languages, any emotions connected to those languages? Okay, fantastic, thank you. German, French, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, French, Spanish, Cantonese, excitement. <laughs> Fantastic. Going very fast now. Japanese, Spanish, Azeri, Cantonese, Swedish. All right. So we've got a big range of languages here. Latin, Mandarin. Okay. A few people wrote some emotions as well. Despair and anger for Finnish. Right, Japanese, do your best. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to those people who contributed to the chat. I'm just going to move on. So a bit of background about myself then and my connection with languages. So of course, my interest in classroom research is partially grounded in my own quite different experiences of language learning. Uh, regrettably, I have appalling memories of French as a teenager in high school. I really couldn't feel any connection between French and my life in rural Australia. 
On the other hand, I clearly recollect uh, a sense of fulfillment and excitement in my undergraduate days uh, when I learned Spanish from my brother uh, because he'd spent time living in Mexico and he wanted to teach it to somebody. I then shifted to Japan with zero Japanese and I put in a lot of effort to study myself and I almost became obsessed with it. At the peak of my motivation, I literally couldn't uh, pick up a book written in my native English. It would have been a waste of time. I only wanted to read Japanese. Yet, as time has passed, I now have very conflicted feelings about Japanese. So I'm relatively fluent in it, but sometimes I kind of wish that I wasn't. My interest in classroom research has naturally also emerged through my experiences as a teacher. I've worked from primary school level where I seem to gain energy myself from the enthusiasm and the interest of the pupils, uh, all the way to teaching young adults now at, in the university context. Um, and these people, in many cases, have a whole lot of experiential baggage impacting their learning. So as a researcher then, I'm interested in intersections between the motivations, the personalities and identities, social interactions, and the emotions of the people in my classrooms. So as I hope even a, a brief reflection on your own experiences connected with language learning and teaching or my self introduction illustrates, we are complex beings. And yet, a lot of research and our education is based on the paradigm of simplicity. Simplicity involves separating elements that are actually linked, for example, looking at distinct factors out of context and removing them from time. It also unifies elements that are diverse, for instance, when we average over a population. So if we think simplistically, we can make sweeping generalizations across people. However, if we think in simplistic ways about the dynamic social people in our classrooms, we end up with them represented something like this, disconnected from time, reduced to a number, and even more generally like this, averaged out as if the same techniques or concepts or theories apply to all. I don't know about you, but I've never seen anyone in my classes who looks like this. Now, numbers are useful for considering general trends, However, if we only collect such information at one point in time, and this data is collected by researchers external to the educational institution, without any understanding of the particular dynamic context, and then on top of this, if we average across people to say that, for example, there's a tendency to anxiety here, we would end up with a, a rather impoverished impression of the dynamic social situated phenomenon of life. So instead, surely we need to understand the learners in our classrooms as real people, people who have multiple intersecting psychological aspects, past experiences, future ideas, people who are further situated in ongoing social relationships within and without the classroom and educational context. That is, we need to consider our learners in a more dynamic, moving and complex fashion. So, in contrast to simplicity, complexity is a fabric of elements woven together. It's the one and the many. 
we can see a pattern through the interactions of colors as we look at the fabric as a whole. And in complexity, these interactions are constantly changing, giving rise to different emergent patterns at different times. So in short, no two classrooms are the same, no two learners are the same. Now, in order to kick our brains out of a simplistic way of thinking and into the realm of complexity, let's try a couple of thought exercises. And again, get ready with the Zoom chat. So I'm going to show you an object. So please look at the following object and think how you would describe it and just type a word or two into the Zoom chat. Okay, that's it. Anything, any ways to describe this in chat? Just words are okay, no sentences. Yes, yes, a small red rectangle dot, a red box, shape, danger, hmm. Red rectangular lecture, window, a small red rectangle, red box. Thank you, lots of lovely descriptions there. So as we can see, people came up with words like red, small, square, rectangle. There's not a lot of meaning to this, although some people have tried to attach meaning. So let's try it again. Please look at the following object and think how you would describe it. And again, just type something into the Zoom chat. Okay, heart, 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 heart. Composite heart, puzzle, pixelated heart, love. Wonderful, thank you very much those people who contributed to the chat. So this time we've got a bit more meaning. Uh, red collection of squares, a heart symbol. Some people attach some meaning to it, like love. Um, some people might have said health as well. So a basic understanding of complexity thinking is that meaning arises through the interaction of elements. It's the parts interacting in certain ways that comes together as an emergent phenomenon. Yet once again, we can go further, we can understand more through looking at interactions with an even wider context. And when we do this, we can also understand that meaning is bi-directional. So the parts interact further to give meaning at a higher level, but the higher level also gives meaning to the lower level. So now we can infer because of these wider interactions with context, the specific meaning of this heart shape, Peach and Mario in love. Let's try one more. So again, a bit of a thought exercise. Look at the oval in the center of the screen and just describe what you see. Just type your chat, your guess into the Zoom chat again briefly. Emoji, angry face, Lego man. Interesting. Anyone else? Emoji, face. Hoi, mm. Okay, let's have a look. All right, so it's a stadium wave when we see it all together. <laughs> Again, in this thought exercise, we can understand that the actions of our focal person, the person in the, the oval in the center, so the actions of this person standing and waving her arms in the air are contributing to a larger pattern or a whole. So without her contribution and the contributions of others, the whole would take on a different form. At the same time, we can understand that the whole also acts on the individual. So it encourages certain behaviors and constrains others. 
our focal person is prompted to act in a certain way. These contextualized interactions all around us and within us are changing over time, engendering different patterns. So some key words for complexity. Uh, complexity takes a, a strong focus on interactions, obviously, which are changing dynamically over time. So that is the parts are co-adaptive. They change their behaviors in response to the other parts and the other parts likewise adapt their own behaviors. So we've got this constant interplay. The parts and the whole are also in open interaction with elements external to whatever we're focusing on. So for instance, the classroom isn't a closed system. Obviously, students bring in things from outside of the classroom. These interactions are what's known as self-organizing. So they're not controlled by any overarching leader. The teacher doesn't control everything in a classroom. And it's through these particular interactions in particular contexts that emergence occurs, holistic patterns that we couldn't have predicted based on an understanding of any one part alone. So through these processes, we get intriguing phenomena like this murmuration of starlings or the ecosystem of a city or a class of learners and teacher. So one profound implication of complexity is for research into education. So as I've reinforced, complexity stresses the importance of considering interactions in particular contexts. And if contextualized interpretations are to be usefully uncovered, it seems natural that practitioner research must play the vital role. So being part of the evolving classroom context, to some degree, teachers have both an insider and an outsider perspective. As Richard Pinner and I put it, who has greater insights into the particular contexts under observation than an integral member? So our take on complexity thinking is that it does more than make a claim that research by teachers would be nice, though it's often not feasible. A complexity perspective urges that practitioner research is imperative if we are to do justice to the, the lived complexity of the people in language learning classrooms. So let's look next at such classroom research. I'll begin with a definition, and this one is taken from Judith Hanks, and I split it into some bite-sized chunks here. So firstly, this kind of research is conducted by the people in the learning context, not by external researchers. So it could be teachers, it could be learners, it could be staff in the educational context. The investigations involve many of the conditions of, of regular research, so they're purposeful, systematic, ethical, often critical. Uh, but this said, some aspects might be a little differently construed in classroom research. For instance, uh, an experimental study is, in theory, ethical in many fields, in psychology too. However, from my point of view, exposing one group to a treatment and having another set as a control group might be ethically questionable in classroom research because teachers ought to be acting for the benefit of all their students. Of course, there are still ways we can do experimental studies, but they won't be the standard way. Of course, as the title would suggest, in classroom research, we examine our own practices in our own places of work and learning. And we do this in order to extend and deepen our understandings of what's going on 
in educational processes. So I'd like to look at three different kinds of uh, practitioner research now. And the first one is called reflective practice. It has roots in the ideas of Donald Shun, uh, although the references here relate specifically to language teaching. Reflective practice has less of a focus on what might traditionally be thought of as research. So it's a process of professional development conducted by a teacher for that teacher. Um, so teachers systematically collect data about and try to understand their own practice. And we use data to examine such things as our beliefs, our assumptions, and our teaching practice. So particularly Mann and Walsh, uh, who are here in the reference, they emphasize the dialogic nature of reflective practice. So it should be conducted in tandem with other teachers, with teachers interacting to develop their reflections. Now, reflective practice discerns three different kinds of reflection. Firstly, reflection in action which is in the moment as something is happening. Then reflection on action, which is thinking back on events and actions. And then reflection for action, which is moving to the future. So it connects our understandings with adaptations for future actions. A final point about reflective practice is the idea of different foci. And again, there are three here. So uh, descriptive, is a focus on teacher skills and behavioral actions. Conceptual is more thinking about our rationale for practice, such as our language teacher beliefs or drawing on theories. And then critical is thinking more in terms of the, the wider ethical implications uh, of what we're doing or the connections to society as a whole. So reflective practice, how can we do it? Well, naturally, there are many different kinds of reflective tools that are relatively feasible for teachers to be able to utilize. So things like journal writing, observational notes, emails, uh, blogging or making an online forum, video recordings of lessons, teacher development groups, shared classroom observations, these kinds of things. So the second kind of practitioner research I'd like to look at is known as exploratory practice. And this was developed by Dick Allwright uh, with Judith Hanks further promoting it, uh, especially recently. So exploratory practice aims to understand the quality of classroom life. And this is an important distinction with some other forms of practitioner research. Uh, exploratory practice sees no central problem as such, but rather it invites people to consider puzzles uh, about which they'd like to understand more. Uh, so these puzzles could be, for instance, successes or failures or simply something intriguing. So it's through this process of puzzling that hopefully classroom life will improve. Another strongly emphasized part of exploratory practice is the use of peppers, which are potentially exploitable pedagogic activities, pepper. Um, I should note, as a teacher, I take some umbrage with the term exploitable, which seems to me a bit ethically questionable, but the idea itself uh, has, has a lot of merit. So peppers, rather than imposing on the people in the classroom with data collection tools that are an addition, we try to combine data collection with activities that people would be doing anyway. So one great example of the use of peppers is in Sal Consoli's work in Britain. Um, so he tried to gain a greater understanding of 
the EAP life worlds of his students uh, and especially their motivations. And he did this in tandem with something they were going to do anyway, their paragraph and essay writing studies. So a final point about exploratory practice is that it sees all involved in the classroom context as practitioners. So not only teachers, but students should also be involved in the process of developing their own puzzles, their own exploratory practice. So the third and final kind of classroom research is action research. And in contrast with exploratory practice, action research does take as its starting point some kind of problematic situation. Um, and we then try to use a, a relatively defined cyclical series of steps to purposefully uh, intervene and try to foster some kind of positive change. So we introduce something that's different to our normal practice, and we collect data on how this change action impacts and illuminates whatever we're interested in. And through detailing this process of change, we also raise awareness of the complexities of teaching and hopefully offer opportunities for others in possibly similar situations to learn from our own contextualized understandings. So perhaps the most novel aspect of action research is this cyclical process. We begin with a stage of planning, thinking about some problematic situation that we want to try to improve or something we wish to understand more deeply. And this could involve getting an initial sense of the context through pilot data collection or consulting with others or examining existing literature in the area of interest. Then based on these initial steps, we develop and introduce some kind of change action, some change to our normal practice. So action researchers attempt to disrupt the status quo. Uh, we try to foster outcomes that all participants will experience as more beneficial, hopefully. We then observe what's going on through the change action. So basically this is where we gather some data. And then the final step in the process involves reflecting on what we've done, uh, looking at our data, interpreting it, thinking how we ourselves are also implicated in the process. After that, we possibly introduce a new revised cycle of action based on our interpretations and what else we'd like to understand more deeply. So just to give you some idea of action research in practice, here's one example from my own empirical work. Uh, in this case, I wanted to know more about the beliefs of my learners about their additional language study. And I asked them to write messages they'd heard about English and where these messages came from and when they heard these messages and things like that. And then they mingled to compare with other students. Then I collected these messages. In the next lesson, I reintroduced four commonly occurring messages such as if you go overseas, your English will improve automatically. Groups then discussed whether they agreed or not with the message and why, and then they reported to the class. So mostly the messages that I reintroduced were, were kind of problematic messages, but actually in hindsight, I could have equally reintroduced some of the more constructive messages for learners to discuss in a, a kind of appreciative practice. Anyway, in the final lesson, I then worked to expand more constructive messages for my students. So I combined a textbook focus on note taking with a short video message from one of my past students uh, about which students then discussed. So these were some different uh, steps in the action research process. So now that we've come to this point, I'd 
like to share some examples of my own classroom research. And please bear in mind that these examples are all based actually in action research change cycles. Uh, but I've pushed things a little further. And I've done this uh, through using something proposed by Emma Ushioda, a small lens approach to research. So this small lens approach asks us to take a more sharply focused or contextualized angle on phenomena of interest. So Emma Ushioda proposed this for considering language learning motivation. I'm thinking more about the emotions of my students. But anyway, Emma urges us to look at how motivation connects with specific dimensions of linguistic development or particular learning events. Today, I'm going to show some examples, especially of the second of these, in which we try to more deeply understand specific, uniquely experienced events and significant episodes. So Emma suggests that we shuttle between looking at particular learners engaging with the surrounding environment to homing in on particular psychological or behavioral processes within the person. But we also always uh, remain cognizant of the ongoing historical context. So we focus on the interactions amongst these contexts to look more holistically at the experiences of the people in our classrooms. So just quickly, a bit of background here. We're going to look at data collected with undergraduates in listening and speaking uh, EFL lessons at a university at which I work. These learners were all in their first year of university study. Uh, and because of that, I assigned them random partners or groups every couple of lessons. Uh, I hoped that that might help them to spread their friendship circles, even in English classes. So the action research change actions were focused on understanding more about the social nature of the classroom. I collected data through reflective journals and activity worksheets that were integrated into the content of the course. Uh, and I also used uh, video cameras, 360 degree video cameras to record group work at times. So the first very brief example relates to one of the change actions I described earlier connected with messages about English study. So as part of this series of change action, I, I thought that showing a video interview with one of my past students might offer a new message, a useful image of what Tim Murphy theorizes as a near peer role model, someone close enough to my current students in many ways that the messages he shared might be informative and motivating for them. So I'd like to show two contrasting impressions of the change action. So this is from the uh, journal of one of the students, Kohei. So for, for many of the learners, watching the video was, was motivating or, as Kohei put it, inspiring. So amidst the other change actions in which students were thinking about various absorbed societal messages connected with English study, this new video message provided a, a more concrete image of what was possible and steps to move towards this possibility. On the other hand, just a moment to read. For a few learners, it had the opposite impact. As Daisuke's extract illustrates, for some, the near peer role model was not felt as near at all. In fact, it seems that being shown possibly yet another example of someone using English combined with other societal messages about having to use English in the future added to already existing suffocating pressure. So, what would you take from this? How would you interpret such reflections? 
Well, in my case, So much traditional research studies what is, in contrast, action research uh, often attempts to change what is, and that's what I was doing here, trying. But in so doing, we almost always focus on positive outcomes, yet change action doesn't guarantee benefit. It will interact with the unique psychologies of our learners in non-linear ways. So we need to also be prepared to support them with potentially adverse effects. And it might seem a little strange as I'm trying to make a complex case for classroom research to commence with an example such as this. But although certainly not what I'd hoped for, in a variety of ways, this experience did help all of us learn more, both myself and my students. The second example is a little more involved. So this revolves around understanding more about a, a short conversation session I introduced at the start of each lesson. Uh, as a kind of fluency activity, learners worked together in pairs or small groups. They chose from a range of prompts and then continued a conversation connected to that topic for between two to eight minutes at the start of the lesson. And these sessions actually witnessed some significant emotional episodes for some of my learners, and I wanted to understand more about them. One of these episodes was a short conversation session late in the semester in week 11 of a 14 week semester with a seemingly critical event for a student called Kazuma in his group with Ricky and Wakana. So here's Kazuma's reflection for the lesson which focuses almost entirely on the short conversation. And I'll just give you a moment to read and just a bit of a rhetorical question there. What emotions can you see Kazuma noticing here? You don't need to type anything into chat. Just think about it yourself. So moving on. So when I combined this with the different perspectives of Cosima's group members, one thing I could interpret was disappointment tempered by feelings of affiliation. So in this context, these people are additional language students, but here they're referring to more general student identities. At this particular historical moment in time, they have a, a lot of assignments. And so they're too busy to watch movies. And this has an impact on the content of their conversation and their associated feelings in the activity. There are also moments of enjoyment evident as Kazuma alludes to an incident when one of his group members, Wakana, muddled the names of two films and this episode is again connected to feelings of relatedness and a different kind of identity as young Japanese people with an interest in the movies of a famous Japanese animation studio, Studio Ghibli. Well, what most caught my attention from Kazuma's reflection was his ideas on acting positively and how this perception had changed over time and his seeming excitement that he, it had changed. So you will remember, of course, that the dynamics of change are important in complexity perspectives. So I wanted to look at the context for this sense of progress. Uh, so I went back to the video footage of the group. And I'm just going to... Yeah, this here in a different way.
Okay, so here's a transcript of part of their conversation in lesson 11. And you can see some observational notes in the right hand column. And let's just listen, especially focus on Kazuma in the blue and think how you can notice his, his proactivity. Hopefully you can hear, I'll we'll try. I didn't see maybe, but I want to see what for the future after that year. I want to watch Hirata movie, so I couldn't watch uh, Recently, I didn't watch Murphy. <laughs> now I don't see any drama. Also, drama. Yeah, I don't watch drama movies. Recently, I don't watch any uh, singers on TV or movie show. How about you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any favorite movie? Favorite movie? I like TV. I like TV too. So. Oh. Oh. Okay, thank you everyone for also confirming that you could hear that. So listening to this extract, right from the start, we can witness Kazuma's proactive engagement. Even though he hadn't watched a movie, he adapts the talk uh, about his future plan. And then, despite seeming disappointment at not being able to think of a word he wants to say, he continues the conversation by returning the question to Ricky, which is, of course, a very natural thing to do. And then when the conversation seems to be kind of petering out, as he's listening, he rapidly thinks of a new question to widen its scope, and he provides his own example. Something also interesting here is that when we think about it, uh, we can observe how Kazuma's sense of progress is located in these moments. So the chance that all group members had been too busy to watch movies affords the possibility for Kazuma's agency and his feelings of progress. But I also wanted to gain more appreciation as to his motivations for trying to act positively. So I looked back at the historical context. I'm just going to stop sharing here for a moment. So when I looked at the lesson series, a total of three lessons that these group members were together, in the previous lesson, lesson 10, I'd had to stop the class at one point because there'd simply been too much Japanese spoken. And I tried to encourage more use of English. In response, Kazuma's journal entry from that week reflected on his own overuse of Japanese and his motivation to use more English. Then in lesson 11, the focal session, at the start of the lesson, I had reminded students about their using too much Japanese the previous week. So these occurrences formed part of the playing field for Kazuma's proactivity and his sense of progress. Also, the group dynamics and relationships of the members seemed to play an important role. So this group was together for three lessons. In the previous lessons, Ricky had been very talkative uh, and he seemed to be flirting with Wakana. All his attention was focused on her. He physically turned towards her. So, of course, in that kind of context, Kazuma was unfortunately 
excluded and he reflected on disappointment in not being able to contribute more. However, in lesson 11, Wakana was quite obviously sick. She was wearing a mask, her eyes were glazed. So there was an almost serendipitous opportunity for Kazuma to act more positively. The final thing I want to look at here with Kazuma, this very detailed look at Kazuma's uh, sense of progress. So a sense of progress naturally implies a process over some time. So the final way I, I tried to understand the emergence of this feeling for Kazuma was through examining his journal entries earlier in the semester. And in so doing, I uncovered interesting interactions with the longer lifetime scale of his understandings of his personality. So I've only got one entry here, but there was a kind of recurring focus in his reflections on an ideal positive man. So we can see from his entry what this ideal involves. Someone who talks loudly, clearly, is easy to understand, acting confidently, not hesitating. So we can observe his intention to change this aspect of his understandings of his personality. So once again, looking in a lot more detail at this data collected via my practitioner research, how did this provide a deeper understanding of my students' experiences and emotions? Well, for me, it reinforced that our learners' emotions are not simply reactions to a moment. Instead, they emerge in a particular situation, but as the confluence of many often socially formed moments. Okay, I'm sure you're all very interested to see what I was going to say about the diversity of emotions, but I am conscious that we're running out of time. So I think I'm going to just skip ahead to my conclusion, if I may. You can see me clicking through my slides. I'm sorry about this. Okay, so a few reflections on practitioner research. So firstly, as a teacher, I, I certainly feel that action research has helped me to develop my pedagogical practice. And thus, as a, a teacher researcher, I feel it immediately offers something to the participants in research. It doesn't just take, it gives back. Uh, I've also found the way that practitioner research emphasizes data collection methods that, that dovetail with teaching. Um, so we don't add anything extra. So that matches with my own values. I don't want to impose extra burdens on my students. Um, and often normal research takes this for granted. I've also found practitioner research to be very empowering for both myself and uh, as a teacher and for my learners. So we, we realize that we can develop and deepen our own understandings in our own contexts based on our own experiences and sharing those ideas. So lastly, how about from a complexity perspective? So reflecting on complexity, well, it prompts us to listen to and value the understandings of particular contexts offered by the people in those contexts rather than outside experimenters. So research ought not to be an elitist activity only for other elites divorced from context. Complexity underlines the need for research by teachers and possibly students as researchers also. As practitioner researchers, complexity also reminds us that we need to be reflexive as to how we are implicated in the research process 
and the emergent interpretations. So the observer is part of the observed. We can't write ourselves out. However, even though it might be us writing about research, uh, we need to remain cognizant that the teacher is only one agent with many elements in the complexity of the learning context that are likely to be outside his or her control. So the way that we look at things, mm, I think, although we might introduce something like change action, we also need to look at things in a more historical fashion, which is what I tried to do with Cosima to try to understand more deeply about my learners' experiences. Okay, so that's about all from me. Uh, I'm constantly told that I should plug my books more. So uh, this is one book that shows you some action research that I did into language learning motivation. So if you're interested, especially in classroom action research, you might be interested in this book. And just one more, this is a volume uh, I edited with Richard Pinner uh, about different aspects of language learner and teacher psychology, so not just motivation, but all of them using complexity perspectives. So if you're interested in learning more about different ways that people are using complexity, then you might be interested in this book. And that's all from me. If you want to ask me more, then there's my email address. Thank you very much.